Well, good morning and happy Pentecost to you. Today is a day where we celebrate the gift of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit who creates faith and sustains faith in us. It is a gift of God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ to sustain and create faith in our hearts so that we may believe in him and follow him. He's also the part of the Trinity that gives us our gifts to serve the Lord and serve one another. And so as we celebrate the goodness of Jesus, his gift of the Holy Spirit, I invite you to stand for opening hymn number 650. gather this morning in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This time we invited to kneel, sit, or stand for a time of silent reflection on God's word and for self-examination. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to stand as we join together in the Psalm of the Day, which comes from Psalm chapter 139. We read responsibly with the congregation, reading the bold verses. 
O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Where shall I go from your spirit or where shall I flee from your presence? If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, if I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, we join together in hymn number 671. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, on this day, you once taught the hearts of your faithful people by sending them the light of your Holy Spirit. Grant us in our day by the same Spirit to have a right understanding in all things and evermore to rejoice in his holy consolation through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated.
The first reading comes from Acts, chapter 6, 1 through 7. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews, because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will anoint to do this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. This is the word of the Lord. Our second reading comes from 1 Corinthians. Chapter 12, 1 through 11, be found in the Pew Bible at page 959. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols. However, you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaks in the spirit of God ever says Jesus is accused and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts but the same spirit and there are varieties of service but the same Lord and there are varieties of activities but the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. And, And to the other, the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit to another the work of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various gifts of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same spirit, who apportion to each one individually as he wills. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 15th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. I did not say these things to you from the beginning, because I was with you. But now I'm going to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, Sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, concerning sin because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. 
concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated as we join together in hymn number 496. I invite you to grab a Bible and open it to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where you can follow along in the bulletin reading. But 1 Corinthians chapter 12 will be our main text this morning as we dive into God's word to hear from him this morning. We begin with prayer, our first prayers for our own hearts and minds. The Holy Spirit would open them to hear the word of God and to be obedient to it in faith. Our second prayer is for our brothers and sisters in Christ. The Holy Spirit would speak to them, uplift them, and encourage them in faith through the hearing of God's word. And finally, I ask that you pray for me that I preach faithfully and truthfully the gospel of Jesus Christ for all to hear. Psalm 19 says, may the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So today is Pentecost Sunday, so I am super excited to preach on the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the importance of the Holy Spirit in our lives. I'm also super excited because I started new asthma medicine this week that makes it easier for me to breathe so I can go longer now before I get tired. Isn't that great? Everybody excited for that? So 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we're going to look at this passage about spiritual gifts because today is Pentecost Sunday. It's the day that God sends the Holy Spirit into the church. The church is birthed, and it's this wonderful moment. But what I want to do this morning is look at what does that mean for us as Christians that the Holy Spirit has been sent into our lives. In our gospel reading in John chapter 16, Jesus says, it's to your advantage that I go away. 
Right now, if you were one of the disciples, you were one of the apostles there, and Jesus has been your mentor and your teacher for three years, he's been your small group leader, your preacher, your pastor for three years, and you love hanging out with Jesus, how many of you would love to hang out with Jesus and do Bible study with him, right? And all of a sudden, he looks at you and he goes, you know what's going to be really good for you? That I leave. How many of you would agree with him in that moment? Right? I, know, I know it's a trick question because we're in church and you're supposed to always agree with Jesus, but if he told you that, you would say what? Well, I know what my reaction would be like, why are you leaving? I think what we have going on is a really good thing. I don't want you to go, right? You would try to keep him pinned down and say, you're not leaving. But he says, it's to your advantage that I go so that the helper, the paraclete, the Holy Spirit will come to you and empower you for the ministry and the mission that God has given to the church. And you all know that with the ministry and the mission that God has given to the church, right? It's the Great Commission. Matthew chapter 28, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, teaching them everything that I've commanded you, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you, and then baptizing them in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? Jesus says, this is what I want the church to be. And the reality is, without the Holy Spirit, we're powerless to do that. We're not going to accomplish anything Jesus wants the church to accomplish without the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. So today, as we look at 1 Corinthians 12 and Acts chapter 6, I want to look at what does it look like for the Holy Spirit to empower the church. And when I say empower the church, I'm not talking about a building. I'm not talking about programs. I'm not talking about ministries. The church, according to Jesus, the ecclesia, the gathering, is you folk. It's all y'all, is the way I like to say it. Right? It is not just the pastors. It's not just the professional church workers. It is all y'all. Everybody has been empowered with the Holy Spirit. Everybody has been gifted by the Holy Spirit to serve the church and to serve Jesus and the Great Commission. So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, point number one. You have the Holy Spirit, all right? So if you like to write things down, today's going to be a little more like a Bible class where you can take notes, right? You, yes, you, looking right at me, have the Holy Spirit. First Corinthians chapter 12 says it this way. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans or unbelievers, you were led astray to mute idols or useless idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit, right? In Luther's small catechism, which we go through in confirmation with new members, we say in the Apostles' Creed section that I cannot by my own strength, power, or might, or reason come to faith in my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ except by the power of the what? Any good Lutherans in the room? The Holy Spirit. So if you believe in Jesus, just a little class participation this morning, show of hands, how many of you believe in Jesus? You're like, he's my Lord and Savior. Okay, good. If you believe in Jesus, you have the gift of the Holy Spirit. He's in you. He dwells in you, right? So you can't look at someone else who you think is more talented or more gifted or are better at other things that you're not good at and go, well, they have the Holy Spirit and I don't. Because what Paul says, what the Word of God says is that if you believe in Jesus, you have what? The Holy Spirit in you. All right, so that's point number one, that you have the Holy Spirit because you believe that Jesus is Lord. Now, here's what the Holy Spirit teaches us and does for us in verses four through six. There are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all in everyone. So what Paul is saying is there's all kinds of ways to serve the church and to serve Jesus. Because when we serve one another, when we love one another, we fulfill that commandment, we are in fact serving Jesus. This is what he teaches in Matthew chapter 25, that whatever you do to the one of these, meaning us, human beings, you've done for me, Right? So when we serve the church, when we serve one another, we love one another with the gifts he has given us, we are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says there's a variety of gifts. And I love the way he says there's a variety of gifts and there's varieties of activities, which is, sounds great, right? Like there's so many activities for us to get done, right? But Paul's saying there's a variety of gifts and there's a variety of activities and there's varieties of service. 
meaning what? This is not a complicated passage. It means there's all kinds of ways to do what? To serve the Lord, to love one another. And the good thing is they're all going to look different. Some will look the same, but they're going to look different. And so your gifts are different than my gifts, right? The example that I give is that I can't sing, and some of you are so sweet and so kind, and you come up after service, and you've told me anybody can learn to sing, and I'm telling you, no, I can't. I can't do it. I've tried my hardest, right? And now I do sing. I like to sing. I wish I could sing, but I can't. That's okay. I don't have that gift. Maybe I'll get that gift in heaven. I don't know. Right, and I'll make up for it with all the angels. But whatever our gifts are, there's a variety of them, and it's a variety on purpose. Because we need each other. We need you in the church. We need your acts of service. We need your acts of love and kindness. All the things that the fruit of the Spirit are in the church, we need those lived out amongst our members, amongst you. Because without it, we can't be a healthy church. Without you, we can't be the church that Jesus has called us to be. And so there's all kinds of ways that we serve together to fulfill the Great Commission. The Great Commission is the goal. Right? There's only one goal of the church that Jesus gave us, which is to make more Christians, to make more disciples, to point more people to Jesus. But how we do that collectively together is by serving with our gifts and our talents and the variety of activities that the Lord has given to us. So this should be a lesson of freedom. This should set you free from the lies of Satan. Because Satan wants you to think, I've got nothing to offer. That's what he wants you to think. He is a father of lies, as Jesus says in John chapter 8. When he speaks, he speaks his native tongue, which is lying. Right? That's what Jesus uses to describe Satan. And so the Bible says, you have the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, the Word of God says, you are gifted to serve in a variety of ways, and they're all valuable. Guess what Satan's going to tell you? I don't have the Holy Spirit. I'm not gifted. No one needs my acts of service. Those are all the lies that the enemy wants you to believe. So you'll sideline yourself and say, well, I don't have much to offer. I don't have this or that or any of these things. I can't do this or that, so I might as well do nothing. And the word of God sets us free from the lies of the devil. Because the word of God says, no, you do have the Holy Spirit. You are, in fact, gifted. And we need your gifts because there's a variety of gifts on purpose. Right? That's what verse 6 says. It is the same God who empowers them all in who? Everyone. All y'all is what Paul is saying, okay? He empowers them in all y'all so that everyone is able to say, I have the Holy Spirit. I'm going to serve God in the way he has created me and designed me, and I'm going to love my neighbor to build up the church and to strengthen the brothers and the sisters in Christ. I'm going to be used by God to fulfill the Great Commission in the way he has called me to be used. Because it is him who is empowering all of us and every single one of us. That's a beautiful message, y'all. That we don't have to listen to the lies of the devil. We go, no, whatever he has gifted you with, he wants you to use it for his glory, for the love of your neighbor, for the building up of each other. So he goes on in verse 7. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So to each, all y'all, is given what? The Holy Spirit. So I'm not making this up. He really did give you the Holy Spirit. To each of you, for the what? The common good. So not so you can sit on your butt and waste it. Sorry if that's mean. Right? We've got to do the law of gospel. I'm a Lutheran preacher, okay? A little bit of law, a little bit of gospel, right? A little bit of law is we sometimes waste the gifts that God has given us. We sideline ourselves, we believe the devil's lies, whatever it might be, maybe we're selfish or uninterested or whatever excuses we come up with, we're afraid, there's a million excuses we come up with to say, I'm not going to serve, I'm not going to help, I'm not going to love my neighbor. But God has gifted you with the Holy Spirit and he has given you gifts and a variety of services and a variety of activities for the common good to build up your brothers and sisters in Christ, to bring in people who do not know the Lord yet so that they will know the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And so he's given to us a variety of gifts, but I want you to see he's given it to each and every single one of you. So if you believe in Jesus, he's got a purpose and a job for you. And that purpose is to serve the common good, to serve and love your neighbor so that more people will know the love of Jesus. Right? But it's rooted in this message of a variety of gifts and a variety of activities and a variety of services. So you'll stop believing the lies of Satan, which is yours don't matter. No, yours actually do matter for the common good. Verse 11 says this again. All of these, all of these gifts are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he will. So the way I like to teach this is God gives you a gift, the Holy Spirit has gifted you, and there is no gift receipt to return it. All right, anybody ever do that for a Christmas gift or a birthday gift? I remember one Christmas I got the same gift twice, once for my parents and the stocking stuff, or one for my aunt and uncle, and the way my family did it, we'd wake up really early, do Christmas at our house, and then go over to my grandparents' house. My mom had, was the oldest of six, so there'd be like 20-something people there with all the relatives and cousins and grandkids and everything, and we'd be doing Christmas. And I remember I opened up the gift, and it was the exact same thing. And my mom always told us to just smile, say thank you, no matter what. But I leaned over, and I went, well, what do I do now? Because <laughs> I, I didn't know what to do with, I got two of the same thing, right? And that's what I learned about gift receipts. You can go to the store, you can exchange it for equal value, right? <laughs> it doesn't work that way with the Holy Spirit's gifts. You don't get a gift from the Holy Spirit. You're not empowered by the Holy Spirit and then sit there and go, well, now what do I do? Well, what you do is you go love your neighbor with that gift. You go serve and help people out in the church with that gift. You're empowered on purpose, and that purpose is the common good. So you don't get to look at God and go, I think you messed up here. I think you made a mistake, and I'd like to return this and exchange it for a different gift. No, he's empowered you. He has created you, designed you, right? When he, verse 11 says, to each one individually as he what? He wills, as he desires means he's doing it on purpose, y'all. He didn't make a mistake. He, did, he didn't do an accident. He didn't, oh, that was meant for her, not you. I'm so sorry. That's not what's happening. The Holy Spirit didn't mess up. He, di he gifted you and empowered you the way you are on purpose, and that purpose is the common good, the blessing of others, loving your neighbor and serving the Lord. Now here's, we're going to jump in, so hopefully you have a Bible open. We're going to look at verses 14 through 18. It's not in the bulletin, but in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 12. Paul goes on to hammer this point home that we need each other. And I want you to understand that you are necessary for the health and the well-being of the church. To not believe the lies of the devil, I don't want you to sideline yourself. I want you to be fully empowered by the Holy Spirit and to serve in the ways that he has gifted you. And so Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 14, he says, for the body does not consist of one member or one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. What is Paul saying? He's saying we need each other. You need me and I need you. We need one another to be the church that God has called us to be and gathered us to be to fulfill the Great Commission with a variety of gifts, variety of service, variety of activities, that we follow Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit, to love one another and to serve him in the way he has created you to, to be and to serve. And so Paul's saying is, you can't just use that excuse of, I'm not part of it because I got this gift. Right? Well, I'm just an eye. I'm just an ear. I'm just, no. no, he's saying, no, the whole body to be healthy needs what? All of its parts. And for the church to be healthy and to be everything that Jesus created and redeemed to be, we need all of the parts working and serving together. Could you imagine how boring this place would be if everybody was a preacher? 
I'm not saying don't become a preacher if God's called you that, that's great. But it would be pretty annoying, right? If after I got done, every, someone else was like, and I've got another thing to say. And after they got done, another person stands up and is like, now it's my turn. You'd be like, can we just have some hymns? Right, imagine like how bad this would be. But that's not the way God designed it. He says, no, he chose the body to be designed the way it is with all of its parts, just like he chose the church to have you in it, to be a part of it, to serve in it, to serve your neighbor, to love one another, to serve the Lord. So you and I are necessary for the body of Christ. So one thing I want to do is look at Acts chapter 6 to show you how this plays out in the church. What does all this gifting look like? So the first thing that happens in Acts chapter 6 is the beautiful early church with Pentecost and everything going amazing and looking great has its first fight. Anybody ever had a family fight before? Show of hands. Let's just all commiserate together, right? Some of you are nodding your head like, never. I want to be part of your family. All right? Right? Families fight because we're made up of what? Sinners. It happens. Right? Guess what happens in churches? Disagreements, tempers, conflict. It even happened in the Bible. I know that might shock some of you. But even in the early church, they had some issues that they had to work through. And one of the things that they did is they worked through it by figuring out who is gifted in different areas by the Holy Spirit to serve the Lord. So in Acts chapter 6, what's going on is there's two groups. There's Greek believers and there's Hebrew believers and the Greek believers' widows are being forgotten when the bread is being distributed out. So each day they would go out, the church would serve its neighbor by meeting its physical needs with bread and food, and the Hebrew widows were being given priority over the Greek widows, which is not right. It's wrong. It's a sin called favoritism. And so the church brings this up to the apostles and say, this is happening, this shouldn't be happening, so what's going on? In verse two of Acts chapter six, it says the 12 summoned the full number of the disciples, so they got the whole church together for a voters meeting, and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Now, that sounds really arrogant, doesn't it? At first glance, it sounds really arrogant. It's like, if there was a need in the church, and I got up at the voters meeting, and I said, you know what? I'm the one that wears the robe and the stole. I'm the one that sweats up here. So it's not right for me to help out in the food pantry. How would that sound to you at a voters meeting? How many of you would go like, let's vote on that and say yes and amen? No, there'd be some questions, right? There should be some pushback. they would be like, well, who's this arrogant guy? Shouldn't he be a serving, right? But this is what they say. We're going to come back to this verse because they're not being arrogant. And I'm going to explain why in a moment. It says, therefore, brothers and sisters, in verse 3, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom, who we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So here's what happens. In the Greek, they use the word diakonin. When it says that we should serve tables, and it says we will appoint to this duty, and when they say we will devote ourselves to the ministry of prayer and the ministry of the word, they use the same word in Greek all three times, diakonin. It's where we get our word deacon from. And what it means in all three instances is service. So what the apostles are saying is, hey, we're called to serve in this way, which is preaching the Bible, teaching people about Jesus and prayer. But what do we need to be a good and healthy church, they say? They say it's necessary to appoint what? These guys to do what? To serve the tables, right? And so what the apostles are actually saying is for us in order to be a healthy church, everything that God has called us to be, we need both. We need to meet the spiritual needs of people. We need to meet the physical needs of people that we're able to. And so the apostles actually aren't being arrogant here. What they're saying is we've been called and gifted to serve in this way, but we're still servants. And we need people in the church who are called and gifted to serve in this way, and they're called servants. You know, the interesting thing what about the deacon word, diakonin, is Jesus uses it for himself multiple times in the Gospel of John when he says, I didn't come to be served but to serve. And then he says, I came to be a servant of all. 
So I want you to see that in Acts chapter six, the way this works out in the church is that they go, look, there's a variety of gifts, there's a variety of activities, there's a variety of service, and we need them all. We need you, we need each other. And so the apostles say, we've been set aside by Jesus to serve in this way. They're not being arrogant, they're just saying we're just serving in a different way. But we also need this act of service happening in the church. Right, we have people that open up the church on Sunday morning for you. We have people that serve as acolytes and readers for you. We have people that serve in the choir to help lead us in worship for you. We have people that set up the altar so communion can happen for you. I don't do any of that. You realize that, right? <laughs> like, and it's a good thing that I don't do anything that, like that because we need each other to be serving in all kinds of different ways for the glory of God, for all of us to be able to worship together and to praise Jesus and receive his word together. So it's a beautiful thing that is Acts chapter six, where the apostles say, look, this thing that's messed up in the church, it's being forgotten, it's important that it isn't forgotten. It needs to happen. And so they appoint people, deacons, to make sure that it happens. Servants in the church that say, this is a necessary part of the church. So I want you to understand, you have the Holy Spirit. You are gifted by the Holy Spirit and you are a necessary part of the church. Whatever your variety of service is, your variety of activity is, your variety of gifting is, it is all needed for the church. Can I get an amen? amen. All right. Show of hands, how many of you agree with me now? All right, that's, that's pretty good participation. It's not 100%, but we'll work on that. But it's neat, you and I are needed for each other to serve the Lord and to serve the church. So here's what happens at the end of chapter six, or at end of our reading. In verse six, they, they set before the apostles and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. It'd be great if we got to say, we were all serving together. We prayed together. We appointed leaders in the church to serve in different ways. We all used our variety of gifts and activities and acts of service to love one another so that the number of disciples in Kansas City continued to grow. Wouldn't that be great? To see more and more people know the love of Jesus. So this is my hope and prayer for us as a church that we, as we celebrate on Pentecost, we don't, we don't forget about Pentecost, that we remember that the Holy Spirit dwells in us each and every day. He has gifted you and I in all kinds of different ways for a variety of service and activities so that the number of disciples in Kansas City will continue to grow. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks for your grace and mercy that you have sent us the helper, the Holy Spirit, to empower us to fulfill the Great Commission that we would make disciples by teaching them about you and your love and your salvation through your cross and resurrection. We pray, Lord, that you continue to empower us with a variety of gifts and acts of service so that we would love one another as a church, serve one another as a church, and by your love, serve our city so that the number of disciples in Kansas City would grow. In your name we pray, amen. I invite you to stand as we confess our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. We confess together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sit at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We go to our God in prayer. Gracious Lord, your spirit fills the world and gladdens your church with the remembrance of all Christ Jesus has spoken. Glorify his name among us in every word and deed. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, guide the church into all truth by your Holy Spirit through your word that we may be guarded from all error and false doctrine 
and other great shame and vice. Lord, in your mercy. God of comfort, give hope to your people in the midst of this world of death and despair. Put your spirit within us to believe, to live, and to serve according to your promises and commands. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, be near to the family of Rennell Kofeld after the passing of her cousin-in-law, Tracy. Comfort all who mourn and grieve through the power of the Holy Spirit and the promise of eternal life. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We call on your name, O Lord, praying in your spirit to help and save all. Renew the face of the earth. Look with favor on your creatures and fill the hearts of your faithful, kindling them in the fire of your love. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, Heavenly Father, through your Son, Jesus, you promised your Holy Spirit, who would convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, enlighten our hearts, that we would confess our sins, obtain everlasting righteousness through faith in Christ, and through every trial and temptation, abide in the consolation that Christ is Lord over the devil, death, and all things. We ask that you would graciously deliver us from all affliction to make us partakers of eternal salvation, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated at this time. We continue our worship by presenting our tithes and offerings. I invite you to stand as we give thanks to God for all his gifts to us by joining together and singing the offertory. be with you. 
Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should all times and all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who ascended above the heavens and sitting at your right hand, poured out on this day the promised Holy Spirit on his chosen disciples. For all this, the whole earth rejoices with exceeding joy. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb, his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Uh, just as a reminder before the words of institution that up at the altar we have available to you individual cups for the wine. We also have available to you the common cup. So if you are interested in receiving the wine through the common cup, just let us know as we're going by and we'll make sure you are served in that way. Our Lord Jesus Christ, when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. When he had given thanks, he gave to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Please stand. May this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve your faith to life everlasting. Go in his peace. Amen. We join together in singing, Thank the Lord. We give thanks to you, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Uh, just one announcement reminder is that we want to give thanks to God for our music director, Teresa Rupert. So next week will be her final Sunday with us, so after service, we will have a time to celebrate her give thanks to God for her service in the church and to send her off in all of her new endeavors. So we want to remind you that there's an announcement in the happenings regarding that. As you go today, go in the blessing and the peace of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen.